My name's Murray. Um, I work in the validation section of Health Facilities Scotland. So, right at the coal face of what you guys have been talking about uh, this afternoon as well. So, I've worked with HFS for 15 years, starting back in 2007. Previously, I was one of the manufacturers uh, as a, a service and then a commissioning engineer as well with a company called Gettinger. I don't know if you heard of them. Um, they're one of the global global giants in healthcare, decontamination, theatre equipment, etc. Um, and then before that, I was an electrician in one of the hospitals on the west side of the country. So I've got a, a lot of experience in decontamination and in the health service and how, how slowly things change as well. So, a week with a validation engineer or a funny thing happened on the way to Shetland. Um, we, we go all over the country on an annual basis validating decontamination equipment. To explain a wee bit about what that is, I need to explain what decontamination is, but I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here. I wasn't sure what my audience would be. So decontamination, as I would explain it, would be anything that needs to be re reused uh, for healthcare at all. So we're looking at surgical instruments, we're looking at endoscopes and all that. So what, what our role is, we look after the machines that reprocess that equipment. So some of that's turned around in a quite a, quite a quick basis if you're looking at en endoscopy where endoscopes are expensive so they don't have that many in the department. Um, and other things are maybe stored for a number of weeks before they're, they're used again if they're specialist stuff as well. So who are we then? So Health Facilities Scotland sit inside national services. So uh, we're, our small part of that would be in procurement commissioning facilities. So there's a lot, of, a lot of names, a lot of departments within departments, but that's where we are. So Health Facilities Scotland uh, has, among other things, but we've got the team of authorising engineers for decontamination. Um, we've got infection control in there, we've got equipment and technical um, and more. But So we're, we're quite a specialised outfit that look after all these sort of small, small but important cogs in the, in the machine. So as I say, decontamination equipment. We've done that. Decontamination equipment is basically anything that either processes reusable medical devices, so that's surgical instruments, endoscopes, but also decontamination, if you think about it, uh, for disposal as well. So we've got to decontaminate laboratory samples, test equipment, etc. Uh, before that goes, goes elsewhere. Um, believe it or not, there's 530 machines that do that decontamination process that we do annual testing on throughout Scotland. Uh, so it's quite it's quite a large number, and that number's growing all the time, and especially in endoscopy. That's where I've sort of ended up sort of specialising. Um, that's probably fifty percent of our work is endoscopy based, and uh, as you know, it's much easier to bring someone in for an outpatient procedure uh, to have a look at something rather than guessing or book them in for expensive surgery as well. So it's better all round. So we we have a. 500 and more uh, of those machines to look after. So those are found in endoscope de decontamination units, central decontamination units where they do uh, the larger hospital loads of instruments, etc., and also local decontamination units. So that would be your dental surgeries, podiatrists, all these sort of places all have decontamination facilities of some kind so that they can reuse their instruments. Uh, we're also uniquely a, a UCAS accredited test house and calibration facility. So what that allows us to do that perhaps other places can't do is we can in turn provide that calibration service to the health boards themselves. So a lot of them do their own interim testing uh, on a quarterly basis or whatever. If they're fitting new parts to machines, they might, might need to calibrate that new part. Uh, and we can provide that calibration service to the boards and we do that. Uh, something like 70, just over 70 pieces of calibration equipment, separate pieces of equipment uh, around the health boards in Scotland that we, we do, everywhere from Shetland down to borders. So, but who are we? So, <laughs> so we're, 
12, 12 guys of various shapes and sizes um, from, from all sorts of backgrounds as well. So some of our guys uh, have been in, in healthcare really all the way through their, their sort of adult lives. And other guys, well, we've, we've got a, quite a strange demographic. Of, of the 12, four of those have previous armed forces experience as well. So I don't know if that's if there's a link there or not, but uh, that, that's just, just how it is. So we're covering all the armed, armed services as well in, in our number. Um, the guys ranging from in their early 30s right through to old guys like myself in their late 50s. So uh, we've, we've got a wealth of experience and a, a range of experience as well. Some of these guys have come from the CDU backgrounds and things as well. So they're, they're right at the coal face and they know on a daily basis what, what sort of problems there are with machines, which helps us to develop that testing protocol as well. So we'll have 12 engineers. Uh, there's more pictures and more of my travels as well, folks. So uh, the first ones, I don't know if you've noticed any, any of the observant ones know where the, the stones are. Uh, Western Isles. Yep, spot on. So those are, those are in Lewis, so that's the Calanish stones. And that's the nurses' accommodation in Stornoway as well. <laughs> <laughs> Needs must. <laughs> so what about that one? The small picture in the bottom right, them, do you know where that is? Is that Close. Not quite so far north. So that, that's Scarabray. So, or not, no. no. If you work really hard and you've got a ferry deadline that you can't change, then sometimes you get an afternoon that you can go and sightsee as well. So, I've been, been really lucky to get the chance to go and visit some of these places as well. And I'm, me being an eternal pessimist, I always think things are going to go badly tomorrow. So I tend to work on a bit, and that then gives you a bit of free time on the next day when you can't change your ferry time anyway. So uh, that's my excuse, Norman. <laughs> so as I say, we've, we've got that varied experience as well from different backgrounds, both private and public sector. What that gives us uh, as well is that unique sort of insight into basically all the machines that are available out there. So if you work, if you work in a CDU and that's your experience, then you tend to only have experience of one or two makes a machine until those are replaced at the end of their useful life. And well, our guys have got that experience spread right across. So we've seen and worked for uh, companies like Getting, as I said, Steris, Hamill, Cantel, uh, Dolby, who do a lot of the, the, the annual maintenance and stuff for the LDU, people that don't have the resources, and Wasmurg as well. So we're, we're really covering all the, all the major manufacturers Another, another trip. That's a COVID trip to Shetland. So we were confined to quarters on the ferry, believe it or not. Um, you turn up, if you've got a cabin, please stay in it. Uh, place your order with the purser for your evening meal and somebody will come and knock on your door. So sitting in a, in a steel box with no window for, for 12 hours, 13 hours on a, yeah, on a roller coaster, not much fun. But it's got to be done. So the, the validation work still got done through through the lockdown, and although, although travel became a bit more difficult, but we understand the importance of these things. So that, that team uh, is spread all over Scotland. We've got engineers now, Kirkcaldy and further, even further east than that, uh, right down to Bigger. Uh, so from Fife through to Ayrshire as well for, for myself. So we've, we've got locations now. We used to have a smaller team intended to be located in the central belt. But we're now sort of diversifying a wee bit just by, by the, the bigger numbers coming on the team as well and a bit of coincidence involved in that. But it does give us a, a, more, a more economical, let's put it, spread of location. So we're within striking distance of most of the, the major sites in Scotland. More machines. You know, all washers up in Orkney, I think. So as I say, those validations happen all through Scotland, uh, the Highlands and Islands, the Western Isles, Shetland to Borders, Stornoway to St Andrews, and everywhere in between. Another late night ferry trip. So a lot of times, if you're you're trying to, if you if you've got test equipment or te uh, samples that need to be processed within a window, so to get that work done and get it back again while the samples are still uh, within tolerance and within, within 
striking distance of the control group, sometimes you have to travel in antisocial hours and things as well. So I quite often I drive all the way up to Wick and then get an evening ferry across to Orkney so that you can be there bright and early the next morning and just start start work straight away. Similarly with Shetland as well, overnight in the ferry and start work straight away the next morning, which is, you're not always at your sharpest, but that's, that's what's got to be done just to make sure that that stuff's coming back to get analysed in the lab as well. So some of these, uh, uh, planning some of these jobs, as I say, it's a bit like a military campaign at times. Uh, sometimes the hospitals would rather you, you visited and did all the machines at the, on the same visit. So uh, there's an, an economy of scale there as well. So we might be able to double up in cars, for instance, so, so cutting back in some of the travel. So we've got a lot of uh, test equipment that we need to transport around the country with us. But what that also means as well is you, you might have spare kit. So if somebody else's kit develops a fault while you're within that testing window, you've hopefully got backup that someone else can borrow or we can we can work on and do the other test as well just to get that done whereas if you're working in isolation that that can't happen so that does help um but uh, say a lot of these uh, samples especially in endoscopy water samples um, and microbiological stuff has to be back on the friday to get put back into the the testing house that are doing that work for us uh, so that's it's important to get there and get back again within that that window So that, that test schedule on an annual basis is really based on when the machines went into service. So that, uh, the local guys will look after that on a weekly and a quarterly basis, and then we come in on an annual uh, basis and do the more, the more comprehensive tests uh, based on that commissioning date. And I see sunset in, in the West, Western Isles somewhere as well. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't resist that. <laughs> So these tests, as I say, if, if you're working on an, an endoscope reprocessor, you, you could be there for several days. If you're doing like a wee benchtop steriliser, that might just be a few hours on site. Uh, and, it, and it varies widely right across the, the range of different types of equipment you get. And obviously travel can vary greatly as well. Anyone know where that is? Yeah, it's it's I, I was so moved when I saw that, I just can't, can't believe it. It's, it's unbelievable. It's almost impossible to, to be there and look at that for the first time without a lump in your throat when you think of the, you know, the, the love and attention that went into the development of that. But I can thoroughly recommend a visit there, folks, if you haven't, haven't been. As it wasn't quite so, the weather wasn't quite so good that time. There weren't any sunset pictures, but it was well worth, well worth the trip. So I've, I've touched a wee bit on what we do. So. The annual, annual validation is really what our, our sort of prime directive is. Um, we do advise a wee bit in procurement and things, but basically we're here to test on an annual basis that 500 and odd machines all around Scotland. So I would say endoscope washers is probably about 50% of that for me. Um, so an endoscope washer, as I, as I said, reprocesses that endoscope so that it can be used again on another patient and there's various types on the market. It's probably the most diverse part of our decontamination as well. Uh, these machines are, the, the, everybody's got their own ideas to how, how's best to do it, which gives us the headache of trying to, to take the tests. It's not a one size fits all, unfortunately, although the guidance is, is there. So we need to try and make that, that fit into the different manufacturers' ideas of, of how they're going to go about it. Some of them start with an endoscope and build a machine round about it to process it. And those are normally quite economical in, in uh, water and resources and chemicals and things. And others have started off with a tried and tested washer disinfector for instruments, and then they'll adapt that for endoscopes as well. So they'll stick on some gizmos and bells and whistles on there and connections to put an endoscope onto it. So those, those tend to be a wee bit more uh, resource heavy as well, but they're also a bit more robust and it's, there's, there's less uh, less technology crammed into a small space as well, so they, they tend to be a bit more reliable. So an annual test, so we do faults and fails, and that, that would involve making sure that the machine fails correctly and doesn't process through as if nothing's happened. So if, if the chemicals didn't doze, if it didn't reach the proper temperatures, 
Uh, if the pressure wasn't there, if the channels weren't irrigated properly, the machine should alarm and tell you that. So we have to prove that that happens. So that's that's done on a, an annual basis. Chemical dose repeatability. So again, it's it's to make sure that that dose is the same every time the machines run to give you the confidence that the chemistry is right. So if if we're reaching the right temperature and we've got the distribution of the water around the system, we need to make sure the chemicals in solution and it's the same it's the same quantity every time. So that's part of our remit as well. Some of these it's just as simple as sticking the lance into a measuring cylinder and watching what goes in the machine. On other ones, they're more complicated. They have load cells built in and they're actually weighing the chemical in. So we have to calibrate the weighing system of the machine as well. And others, they're fortunate enough that they've built into the system a means where you can catch what's being delivered. So as if it's going in the chamber, but you can divert it and catch it and, and measure it that way. So there's a, the test has to be changed quite often with the different, the different pieces of kit that you're testing. Channel patency, so the one, the one issue with an endoscope to process it, if you're, look, if you're comparing it to a, 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 piece, a surgical instrument, a simple instrument, as you can't see down a metre and a half tube, two millimetre in diameter, or even some of them are one millimetre in diameter, uh, that flexes is, is an impossible thing to actually check. So we have to try and make the system as robust as possible to make sure, to be as sure as we can be that we're processing that. So to do that, the machine monitors the pressures down those channels, and if the pressure increases beyond a, a sort of a set limit, it should alarm and let you know there's something not quite right. We've got a, a blockage or we've got a restriction in one of those channels. It might just be the scope's overly kinked, so it's, it's not getting a, a clear path. So back out the machine and back in might be enough. But as far as testing goes, so we need to prove that those thresholds are the way they were set up when the, the machine was manufactured. And they're all different again, so they introduce different tests to reassure the customer that their machine's doing what it should do. Similarly, a disconnection can often happen as well. If, if the, the operators haven't properly connected the channels on, you might get a situation where one pops off. So you need to make sure that the machine reacts to that as well and lets you know something's not quite right. One of the channels has come off. So that's one of the surrogate devices we would use. So you've got a windmill lumen a metre and a half long and you restrict it to 0.5 millimetres on the end and the machine should see that as enough of a restriction that it, that it flags up. But if you think about that in, in practice in the real world that's, that's quite tricky so you quite often get machines that are so sensitive that they're giving nuisance failures to the users as well so it, it's, something, it's something that's a, a really high bar to, to get over. Cleaning efficacy test so we've proved that the machine reacts to the chemicals being there or not being there or any of the services not happening. I mean, believe it or not, 30 years ago, I've seen a washer go through that didn't have any final rinse water go in. And it was quite happy to just carry on and finish this, the, the cycle. If I hadn't been watching it, it wouldn't, wouldn't have been noticed. I won't tell you where it was, but it's long gone. It's in the scrap. Um, so we've proved that the, the process is working. We've proved that the channel de uh, channels are detected if they're blocked or disconnected. So the next stage that we can do is we can have a look at cleaning efficacy. So we put on a known bird in a test soil, which is visible, it's a pinky colour, run it through the process. It should be visi visually clean, but also you can try and recover protein from that with, with clean trace swabs as well. Um, and so it's, it's not doing the whole job, but at least we're reassuring ourselves at each step there that we're getting that decontamination process uh, as robust as we can and it's repeatable. And these are some of the the swabs and some of the before and afters of the, the thing. So it's not blood, it's just it's just a, a chemical dye that's in there to give it a bit, a bit of a visual appearance. Uh, and there are proteins in there that we can detect as well. And then the final stage would be inoculated surrogates. So we've, we've got uh, four sort of common bugs that you all know uh, that we would use through there, just bugs that are normally found in, in human beings anyway. Uh, and they're easy to grow in the lab, and they're easy to, to grow in such a way that they're not harmful if they are left in residue in the machine, and it's easy for them to try and recover those from the surrogate. So once we process them through the machine, those get packaged up and refrigerated. We'll get them back to the lab within 24 hours, uh, and then they'll try and recover that organism and, and physically count it. Yeah. Okay. So after all of that, we need to make sure the thing's calibrated. So 
we run through thermometric tests with that calibrated test equipment that I was talking about. So we're looking for controls within one degree. So it's, it's pretty accurate to make sure that that process is repeatable as well, as I say. And then the times uh, and the chemical dose and everything all tie together and give you a, a repeatable process through the machine by means of that auto automatic control test. And final rinse water quality tests. So just what's been spoken about earlier on this afternoon as well. So that, there's a full suite of tests gets done there as well. So it's not just endotoxins and TVCs. We're looking at the actual quality of that final rinse water. Most of these machines now run in reverse osmosis water for the whole process anyway. So there's no tap water anywhere near it. But it is something worth thinking about. It's only as good a process as, as the quality of the, the water that you're putting in it. So... That's all important as well. So we can we can have that machine shut down within sort of 48 hours if we don't get the, the results that we're looking for through that. So I've got I've got more on there about instrument washers, which is much the same process, which I'll gloss through because I'm getting the hurry up. And sterilizers as well, guys. So we we look after. That's it. Cow layers when it was getting commissioned. That's when I used to work for getting in that picture. I, do, I don't have any sterilizer operational pictures or test pictures because I haven't been doing that for quite a long time. So I've covered who we are and what we do, but why have HFS? Well, it's that dynamic assessment of equipment fitness as, as we go. So the, the key thing for me though is taking that SHTM, and we've got new ones coming out now, and applying it to that machine because they're all different. So bearing in mind that difference in the manufacturer's approach to it, we have to try and rationalize the testing and make sure that it's actually giving us the results that we want. And the machine's behaving as it was designed because a lot of the time that physical test, it just can't jump that high. It's not going to do it. So adjustment on that machine, condition and performance, we can advise. We can even help the guys on site um, to, to, uh, to get that through the test. If we're having problems, we can work with them. We're not, we're not there to uh, police them as such. So, uh, the key points as well, we're not part of any health board, so we're not, there's, there's no vested interest there one way or the other. We're not tied to a manufacturer either, so we're, we're not pushing our product or, or anything. We're purely there to, to test that machine. So that impartial independent test, pass or fail, it doesn't, it doesn't matter to us one way or the other. We're UCAS accredited, as I say, so that helps these organisations as well. If that CDU or LDU uh, are UCAS accredited, then they can lean on the fact that they've got a UCAS accredited test house as well. A bit of advisory to procurement and commissioning as well, health boards as they're thinking about new machines going in, as impartially as possible of course, and working with those site engineers to say problem solving. I think the, the big thing as well, being top slice funded, so there's no, we're not profit driven in any way, it, it, it's, we're not, we haven't got that underlying motive to sell parts, to recycle anything, to, you know, to, to stake our claim any higher than it actually is. We're only there to do that annual test. And we can flag issues. If there's non-compliances, we can flag that straight through uh, with Celeste and the wider health facility Scotland and ultimately to the health secretary. So we, we can escalate that. So just to finish, guys, so when I'm not doing this, I referee rugby on the weekends um, and the proper game, not the football. And the, the, the key one for me out of the law book from World Rugby is the referee is the sole judge of law, of time and of fact on the field of play. And I feel that's a wee bit like a validation engineer as well. <coughs> so I've been chasing some girls. <laughs> that's Scottsdale as well. So.